Stories of Conversion. C. Alan Ames is a Catholic mystic who began his healing, speaking, and writing ministry in 1993, after undergoing an unduly dramatic conversion involving heavenly visitors and a personal illumination of his conscience. Since then, the Lord has sent him around the world to heal and convert thousands, through his holy zeal and extraordinary charisms with which the Lord has gifted him. Alan lives painfully the passion with the hidden stigmata, which is sometimes made visible. Today he has published over 20 books and continues to receive messages from the Holy Trinity and the Saints. In 1993, when I was 40, I traveled frequently for my job as a sales manager for a pharmaceutical company in Perth, Australia. On one of my work trips, I flew to a city called Adelaide and went through my monotonous routine of checking into to a hotel and sitting on the bed to watch television. Though normally a heavy drinker, I hadn't downed any booze because I didn't generally consume alcohol on a work day. While I was watching the evening news, all of a sudden, directly in front of me appeared a horrific-looking man who reached his arms forward and began to choke me. He had dark skin and bulging eyes, with lips drawn back in a snarl that exposed his ghastly teeth. But I was less concerned with his appearance than the fact that he was strangling me. I tried to use my martial arts moves against him, having been captain of the Australian team in the Aikido World Championships, but my hands passed right through his body. Nothing I could do would stop his stranglehold. After a few minutes of useless fighting, the veins in my neck were about to burst, and I believed I was taking my very last breath. Then an audible voice in my head said, Pray the Our Father. That was the last idea I would have come up with, but in desperation, I started to pray it, and the strangling stopped. Then I stopped and the strangling resumed. Every time I ceased to pray, the strangling started, and every time I resumed, the strangling stopped. To add to this nightmare, I was trapped and couldn't move. I tried repeatedly to get out of the hotel room, but the terrifying man kept me pinned in a stranglehold and this went on all night. The experience was so strange and frightening that I thought I'd gone mad, that's it. I'm absolutely crazy. I'd heard of people who drank in excess and would see pink elephants traveling up the wall, so I figured I was one of them. Then I saw my neck in the large hotel mirror. To my amazement, it was bruised, therefore, I couldn't deny the attack was real. Yet I couldn't accept it either. The next day, I heard the same voice in my head that had told me to pray the Our Father. He told me he was an angel whom God had sent to help me. I didn't believe in the existence of angels. To me, they were nothing more than make-believe fairies. He said God had sent him because God loved me and wanted my love. If God exists, I answered back to this fairy in my head. Surely he wouldn't love someone like me. I had good reason to think I was a poor candidate for love. God had always been the furthest thought from my mind, and troublemaking the first. I was born on November 9, 1953, in Bedford, England, north of London, to an English dad and an Irish Catholic mum from the County Kerry. She was often praying the rosary, attending church, and trying to bring me up in the faith, but I had no interest in religion whatsoever. Ignoring her efforts completely, I preferred to leave the house in order to play and steal money, causing my mum multiple heartaches. Coming from a poor family, I was hateful toward those who had toys, who had holidays, who had things I couldn't have. Even from a very early age, I didn't believe God was real. Perhaps a group of wise men had gotten together and jotted down guidelines on how we should live without hurting each other, and wrapped it up in this story called Jesus. At age 12, I started drinking alcohol and was brought before a court judge for taking money out of the candle box in St. Edmund's Church in Edmonton, London. At age 14, I had the worst record of all the students at a Jesuit school in Stamford Hill, and was finally expelled for stealing. 
I thought the only way I was going to get treated with any dignity was to follow in the footsteps of my father, an aggressive, alcoholic gambler. People were frightened of him and gave him a grudging respect, which he gained through violence. I copied his habits, including his constant drinking, because alcohol gave me good feelings and numbed me to all the bad things in my life. But the next day would always come, when everything felt worse, so I would drink again to drown the consequences. I lived in a dangerous part of London with my parents and my four brothers. In my teen years, I joined a motorcycle gang and became extremely violent. Most of my friends were like myself, thugs and thieves. My best friend killed someone, another friend was murdered at the age of 17, another was blinded in a fight, and another tried to murder an older woman. I learned Aikido because at 5 feet, 7 inches tall, I realized there were a lot of men out there much bigger than I. When a man who had been protecting me was put in prison for 12 years for murder, I worked hard to better protect myself and eventually achieved a fourth-degree black belt, later becoming captain of the Australian team in the 1992 World Championships in Tokyo. I had a very bad temper, and the martial arts taught me how to use it to harm people, break their bones, punch them, kick them, and even kill them. I hurt others out of jealousy because they seemed to have what I didn't money and the love of a happy family. At age 18, I met my Australian wife-to-be and covered up my real self so she would like me. She noticed me drinking a lot but didn't realize I was addicted to the stuff. She must have loved me. She married me. We lived in London and life was hard for me there as an uneducated, struggling warehouse worker, so my wife said, let's go to Australia. Life is better there. I agreed, and we moved to Perth in 1976. Several years later, I managed to obtain my job with the pharmaceutical company by lying to get the position. To keep the job, I had to actually study the topic of medicine, and my learning paid off because I stayed there for 10 years, rising to sales manager. It was a great job, an easy job, which paid lots of money and provided plenty of opportunities for raising cane. Drinking is very popular in Australia, and I fit in quite well. Outside of work, much of my life revolved around carousing, fighting, stealing, swindling, and lying. I believe the only thing I didn't do was murder, but I came frighteningly close to it a few times. I lived for power, money, and a good time at all times. But suffering always dragged down my dreams because my pleasure came from sin and addictions, with their lingering imprint of pain, hurt, loneliness, and emptiness. My life was a dark one when the angel started to visit me. Even when I heard his voice, I still didn't believe that he existed, so I said to him, prove you are real. And he did. He started to tell me of different things that would happen in my life, which I shared with my wife and, to our amazement, they all came true. The angel was gentle, but I didn't listen to him, therefore, in his stead, God sent in the big guns. One night, when I was again in the city of Adelaide, but staying in a different hotel, St. Teresa of Avila appeared in my room, wearing a brown Carmelite habit. Her face looked hawkish and stern, like that of a strict school teacher. She proceeded to give me a kick up the backside, saying I needed to change my life completely to avoid going to hell, which she then described in frightening detail. That woke me up. Before then, hell was only a made-up myth to trick people into living better, but now, if that place existed, I certainly didn't want to go there. Saint Teresa explained to me that I had to start loving God and my fellow men. Each person, she said, is created in the image of God, and to love Him would naturally mean to love other people, regardless of their differences or behavior toward me. Then she revealed what could also be mine, she told me all about heaven. That is where I want to go. You can reach paradise, she said to me, anyone can. If you live your Catholic faith, you are guaranteed heaven. Then she insisted, pray, pray the rosary, and asked me to go get one. 
I didn't want to pray. Prayer was boring, so I looked for excuses, where can I get rosary beads at this time of night? There is a shop around the corner that is open and sells rosary beads. A.T. 9.30 at night. That's impossible. You go there. This is totally nuts, I thought to myself, as I walked outside. Turning the corner, I saw a religious shop. It was open, and they were stocking inventory. St. Teresa directed me downstairs where many rosaries were on display. I couldn't believe it. She showed me a brown rosary, which I later discovered was the color of the Carmelite order to which she belonged. Get that one. She urged. Rosary in hand, I went back to the hotel room. Standing in front of St. Teresa, I resumed my litany of excuses, I can't pray this. So many prayers, too many Hail Marys and Our Fathers. I can't do this. Each night, as an insurance policy, I was accustomed to saying ten seconds of prayer. I figured if I died in my sleep, God would take me to heaven that is, if it existed. Pray the rosary, she insisted, and pray fifteen decades. Which equals three entire rosaries. Ugh. I didn't like prayer, so I started a big argument with St. Teresa. You must pray, she said, and you must pray the rosary because you risk losing your soul. You are going to hell unless you change. Needless to say, she won the argument. I didn't really know the rosary, so she explained to me how to pray it. She said that I should see it as a window into the life of God on earth, that I should place myself beside Jesus and walk with him through his life. By doing so, his grace would reach inside of me and touch me in a powerful way. Every prayer of the rosary, she told me, is a step away from evil and a step toward God. See the rosary as a chain you are hanging around the neck of Satan, which will weigh him down and break his grasp on you. From my first rosary prayer, I felt a peace, a happiness, an excitement within. I couldn't stop laughing, and I couldn't stop crying. No drugs or alcohol could have given me what I was feeling at that moment. The more I prayed, the stronger this feeling became, until suddenly, I had finished fifteen decades. I wanted to continue. Why is this happening? I asked St. Teresa. When I see other people praying, they often have long faces and look miserable, as if they were forced to pray. Yet this is really joyful, wonderful stuff. Don't other people experience what I'm experiencing in prayer? Well, often they don't, she answered, because so often when they pray, they're thinking about themselves. They're focusing on their lives, their problems, their concerns. When you focus on self, God gets pushed aside. When God comes second, and self is first, your heart actually starts to close to God and stops His grace from filling you. However, when you focus on God in your prayers and look past yourself, past the world, that is when your soul opens, and God pours His grace in abundance deep inside of you. She said I should tell people that when they begin to pray, the first thing they should do is turn to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, I can't pray properly. I'm weak. I'm human. I'm fragile. I'm easily distracted, taken into thoughts of myself and the world. But you, Lord, lead me past that. Help me to pray properly. Help me to focus on the Father, the Son, and you, Holy Spirit, so that my soul can be opened and I can receive the grace that is there for everyone in prayer. She continued, Once you do that, once you seek God's help in prayer and in all you do, then you can start to experience what prayer is meant to be, a joyful gift of God's love. If prayer is a burden, a chore, a duty, this is often because prayer is self-centered and not God-centered. Remember, in all things, God must come first. 
Look to God in everything, and then you will receive His joy in all you do. From the moment I started to pray the rosary, Satan's grasp on me weakened. My addictions fell away, and I had many of them, alcohol being the primary one. This is nothing I did, but a grace from God. Anyone who has been addicted to alcohol knows how hard it is to quit, and I stopped immediately. In moments of temptation, when I felt weak and so alone, hurt, rejected, and unloved, I was freed and strengthened by remembering St. Teresa's words to me. Every time you feel a desire to do wrong, think of Jesus. Just think of His name, think of Him suffering on the cross, or see the host before you. Keep concentrating on that and you will see your desires fall away. Soon after St. Teresa of Avila paid me a visit, other saints came to speak to me as well. The first three were St. Stephen, St. Andrew, and St. Matthew, who encouraged me to read Holy Scripture, which I did. When I went back to England for a holiday, they directed me to walk into St. Edmund's Church, the same church where I had been caught stealing as a child. I ended up staying for Mass, which was unusual for me at the time. Afterward, as I knelt and prayed in front of a Sacred Heart of Jesus statue, it suddenly began emanating a white light and came physically alive before my startled eyes. Then the statue transformed into the Blessed Mother dressed in white, with light shining forth from within her. So much love was in her smile, and her beauty defied words. How can I adequately describe her, her eyes were blue and her hair black. She may have been my wife's height, about five feet, six inches. But this says little. I could see her heart circled in white roses and superimposed on Jesus's sacred heart. Never had I heard about the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and only the next day, from a glance at a prayer card, did I realize what I had seen, their two hearts as one. I was further stunned and Blessed Mother Mary began speaking to me from the living statue. Her first words were, pray, pray, pray. In my flustered and flawed logic, that meant increasing my rosary prayers by three times, so I began to say many decades of the rosary, every day. Mary also told me she was my mother and that God has given her a wonderful grace to bring people deeper into the heart of Jesus. From that point on, she would visit me and do just that. In 1994, Blessed Mother Mary said to me one day, My son is coming to you, and before me was Jesus on the cross, telling me he loved me and he wanted to forgive me. It was the greatest day in my life but also the most difficult because I was shown how all my sins, from childhood to the present, had contributed to his suffering and dying. There were so many of them. It seemed as though I was sinning every second of my life. I saw how every time I had hurt someone, I was hurting Jesus. Any time I told a lie, I was lying about Jesus as he suffered and died. Every time I gossiped about people, I was below the cross with those gossiping about Jesus as he hung in agony. Any time I made fun of others, I was making fun of Jesus as he died for me. Even the smallest sin, even the thoughts I had toward others of dislike, anger, hate, or frustration seemed so big. And to see my grievous sins was absolutely terrible. Jesus showed me the state of my soul, which was putrid. He revealed how my sins not only hurt other people but often led them into sin, such as when they tried to imitate me or responded with anger or violence. I felt so ashamed, so unworthy and offensive. I wanted to run away but couldn't. And Jesus wouldn't leave me. Worse yet, he kept me telling me he loved me and longed to forgive me. Then the view changed, and I saw Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, taking into his heart the pain, the hurt, the suffering from my sins and everyone else's, from the beginning through the end of time. It is no wonder he sweated blood. 
I saw the strokes of the whip and the crown of thorns as my sins. I saw Jesus carrying the cross and myself sitting on top of it with my pride, making it heavier and heavier. I saw each of the nails, the thrust of the spear. I saw Jesus hanging on the cross just loving me, and calling out that he wanted to forgive me no matter how much I hurt him. Through all those times, he said, I was still there, by your side, loving you. I fell to the ground crying, seeing how much throughout my life I had hurt my sweet, gentle, and wonderful Lord. I didn't want to live. I begged Jesus to let me die and to send me to hell because I didn't feel that I should exist anymore. But Jesus kept calling out to me. For five hours, I cried and cried, curled up on the floor, sobbing like a baby, begging Jesus, let me die, let me die. To see his blood running down his face as he called out to me through his suffering, I love you. And I want to forgive you, was the deepest pain I've ever felt in my life. Eventually with his grace, I built up the courage to ask for his forgiveness. Reaching out across a chasm of shame, I said, Forgive me, dear Jesus. I do forgive you, he answered. At that moment, I felt a tremendous weight of sin being lifted from me. His love touched my soul in such a wonderful way that I never wanted to lose his presence again. Possessing him, I knew, was the most important thing in life. I felt refreshed, renewed a different person. I couldn't stop telling Jesus that I loved him and wanted to love him forever. I knew I could never hurt him again purposefully, and I never wanted to be away from him. I fell in love with Jesus that day, and I totally committed my life to God. After I asked for the Lord's forgiveness, he said to me, go to confession. Wait a minute. I responded. I've even been through five hours of crying my eyes out, begging you to let me die and send me to hell, while you took me through all these sins I committed, and then you said you forgave me. Now, why do I need to go to confession? I thought confession was a power trip for the priest. After you tell him what you've done wrong, he tells you off, gives you some prayers as a punishment, then you go outside, say them as quick as you can, and rush out of the church. The next time you see the priest, you avoid him. Knowing my thoughts, Jesus said to me, it's not that at all. You need to have the grace through the sacrament to help you through your weaknesses. So I learned directly from the Lord that He gave us confession to help us, strengthen us, purify us, cleanse us, to bring us closer and closer to God and to heal our souls. It is important that you go, Jesus told me. You must confess all your sins. So off I went into the confessional box and said, in essence, please, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. I stole this little thing and told this little lie, and forgive me for anything else I have done. I figured that covered it. I didn't want the priest to know how bad I really was. When I came out of the confessional, Jesus said, Understand that when you don't confess all your sins, you hold on to the pain and hurt and suffering that comes with them. If you do not confess all of your sins, it is easy for Satan to lead you into more sin because you are not only left feeling bad about yourself, but you also have that sin residing on your heart, on your very soul. It remains a weakness there, a doorway where evil can enter and lead you further away from God. It is also important that you continue to recognize your mistakes, and once you do, come to confession and ask for forgiveness. Do not push them aside and say they are not important. Understand that it is important to get rid of every sin. I went back to reconciliation the next day and confessed all the big sins I could remember. I was in the confessional box such a long time, crying and blubbering, that I started to feel very sorry for the priest. Many times, I have said to St. Stephen, St. Matthew, and St. Andrew, why me? There are so many good people who come to church because they love God. 
so many religious people. Yet you are talking to me who has been so bad, who is so bad. I just don't understand. They explained, it is because God loves you, and he loves you the same as anyone else. The only difference is how much you love God. Also, God appearing to you. Someone who was so far away from him, shows that his love is there for everyone. Even the worst sinner. Not just for a select few. When Jesus forgave me from the cross, and I accepted, I told him that whatever he asked of me, I would do, regardless. And he keeps me to that. Every time I don't want to do a request of his, he reminds me of that promise. When God came into my life, the first thing I wanted to do was quit the job. I thought I would never leave in order to do his work. And that is exactly what Jesus asked of me. He said, it's going to be difficult. It's never going to be easy until the day you die. But don't give up. From the beginning of my ministry in 1994, I have sought the sanction and guidance of the Church. The Archbishop of Perth, Most Reverend Barry Hickey, first supported me for 17 years. I saw him frequently, and he appointed a spiritual director who checked all of my writings and supervised my work. After him, Archbishop Timothy Costello and his auxiliary Bishop Don Sproxton have given me their support, which is documented in writing. The mission Jesus gave me is to go out into the world and tell people that God loves them, and that he doesn't want to condemn or punish them. Since 1994, the Lord has sent me around the globe to be his instrument of healing. And to bring people closer to him and his church. The Lord has said so often that there is a day of judgment coming. No one knows when it is, and I do not profess to. What Jesus says to me is to tell people to pray, receive the sacraments, turn back to God, love God, and love each other. Then when that day of judgment comes, they will be rewarded by God, not punished. I believe that the warning or the mini-judgment, which many people are concerned about and some are looking forward to, is akin to what the Lord took me through. I hope I will never have to experience it again, but I am sure that I will. By suddenly taking away those rose-colored glasses through which we see only the goodness in ourselves and think of how wonderful we are, by showing us how we have really been living and how offensive to God our sins are, he hopes we will not want to sin anymore. Change. Pray. Receive the sacraments. Love each other, do not hurt each other. Live in God's love and avoid hell. Because if you do not, that is probably the place where you will go. This is the message. The message he gave to me. The message he is giving to anyone who will listen. God is real, and he is offering everyone his love. His love. Forever in heaven.